Hello and welcome, and um, thanks for joining us on this perimenopause webinar. My name is Dr. Janice Jorgis. And I'm a mother of four. Um, my oldest is actually 15 years old and my youngest is four months. So um, I definitely, along with having my hands very full, I do have a lot of experience when it comes to um, not only uh, fertility and um, having children, but also hormones in general. And I just turned 40 in August. So perimenopause is very near and dear to my heart right now. As I mentioned, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I graduated from an accredited four-year university, and I'm a board member um, as a naturopathic uh, representative for the Illinois Homeopathic Medical Association. As a naturopath, homeopathy is one of the tools that I utilize in multiple situations, and I absolutely love it. So I'd like to start by defining some terms for you. Maybe you've heard the word menopause before. Menopause is the absence of menstruation, which is your period for 12 months. So if you go 10 months without having your period, but then it comes back, you haven't hit menopause yet. You're still in perimenopause. And perimenopause is the transition time leading up to menopause. It can uh, um, last a short amount of time or even up to 10 years. And the average age of menopause for women in the U.S. is 51. Keep in mind that that's the average age, which means some women are going to go through menopause earlier in their 40s and some late into their late 50s, even early 60s. Perimenopause being that transitional time, what's happening there is the ovaries stop producing estrogen and the adrenal glands take over as the primary producers. We're not ovulating, which means the eggs are not being released from our ovaries because we've run out of eggs now at this point and we're no longer fertile. So I just mentioned estrogen. What is estrogen? It's a sex hormone and it regulates the menstrual cycle, but it also affects other areas within the body. It affects the urinary tract, the cardiovascular system, which is your heart and your blood flow, bones, your breasts, your breast health and development, skin, hair, the mucous membranes, like what's in your mouth, um, around your nose, in your eyes, um, your pelvic muscles and the brain. And progesterone is another one of our sex hormones. And when you hear progesterone, I want you to really focus on that just part because that's short for gestation. Gestation is pregnancy. So progesterone supports pregnancy. It also reduces inflammation overall in the body. It lowers blood pressure. It supports the density of bones. It regulates mood and it improves sleep quality. So these are really important to keep in mind as we continue to talk about perimenopause and the shifts that will be happening in, um, happening with the estrogen and progesterone. So here, um, normally, these are the hormone changes during the menstrual cycle. So there's three phases to the menstrual cycle. There's the follicular phase, there's uh, the ovulation phase, which ovulation is here with the dotted line. And then there's the luteal phase. So the menstrual cycle actually starts on day one of bleeding that starts off your menstrual cycle. And then you're, um, you go into the follicular phase where that's where the follicle. Now, a lot of times when we think follicles, we think like hair follicles, but that's actually not what this is. The follicles are in the ovary and inside of the follicle is where the egg will develop. So the FSH is a follicle stimulating hormone. This gets the follicle ready to make the egg. So that FSH um, gets released. And then that drives up the estrogen because the estrogen's job is to get the uterus ready for implantation by the egg. So then just before ovulation, if you see where that little dotted line is, just before ovulation, the estrogen is supposed to drop. Luteinizing hormone, which you see it's in the luteal phase, that means that's the second half of our phase after ovulation. So that luteinizing hormone gets the egg to come out of that follicle. And then if it's not, um, if the egg isn't fertilized 
then it becomes the corpus luteum and that produces progesterone. Okay, so see how estrogen rises in the follicular phase and progesterone rises in the luteal phase. So this becomes really important when we're assessing um, the health of a woman's menstrual cycle because the menstrual cycle is actually a key to the overall health of the body. So during menopause, that menstrual cycle will shift. There, there's less ovarian function because there's less eggs. And sometimes the body will start dumping out a lot because our species wants to continue, right? So your body says, have a baby, have a baby, have a baby until there's no eggs left. And so sometimes we see that the estrogen goes really high or it can drop really low. Typically progesterone will drop before estrogen does because you can have cycles with no ovulation. Those are called anovulatory and you, and you bleed. And so if you bleed, you probably assume, oh, I must have ovulated. But sometimes what happens is the lining of the uterus has built up so much that it sheds. And that's what the bleeding is. It's not actually due to the ovulation. And if there's no ovulation, then, right, what we talked about, then the progesterone isn't being created by that corpus luteum. And the entire endocrine system is involved. We so often like to think about things in neat little boxes and everything separate, but that is not how the human body works. The endocrine system involves all of your hormones, not just your sex hormones. So, um, in the beginning, we had talked about everything that estrogen and progesterone can affect. So I'm sure it's no surprise that there are so many symptoms of perimenopause. So it, it starts often with menstrual changes. Sometimes women will say my period always came every 28 days, which is great actually, because a typical cycle should be 28 days. That gives you enough time in the follicular phase, your ovulation, and then the luteal phase as well. So sometimes we start seeing some of those menstrual changes right away. Also hot flashes and night sweats. Um, we can also have changes in weight. So estrogen, there's three types of estrogen. And one of the types of estrogen is produced by, um, by tissues um, and specifically fat. And so your body, if you previously were storing your extra weight, your fat in your thighs and your hips and your buttocks, now that will be shifting to more visceral body fat. So more in your abdomen and along with gaining this weight and difficulty losing weight, if you have high cortisol, which is a stress hormone and you have high insulin, you cannot be burning fat. Okay, we'll talk about insulin a little bit more, but you cannot be burning fat in those um, in that environment. So that's also part of why we're looking at these hormones to see, okay, what exactly is going on? Also, as you can probably tell, these symptoms of uh, perimenopause, they're all over the place. And this is what I like to tell my patients when we're talking about perimenopause. This is a good time for us to pause right? It's kind of silly, but it's true because we can look and see the way that we've been handling our life and the decisions that we've been making up until this point. You know, a lot of people will come in and say, but I could eat these foods before and they never bothered me. And now I, now I eat these fries and my fingers start swelling up or I used to be fine with five hours of sleep and now I get six and I'm still exhausted. Or, you know, I was sharp and now I've got brain fog. So what we want to do is we want to take those signs and symptoms and see what area of the body, what organs and what systems of the body those align with, because that's showing us that there is dysregulation in those areas. And once there's a fluctuation with the estrogen and the progesterone, the dysregulation is coming to the surface because there's nothing keeping it regulated anymore. Okay. I do want to um, point out a few of these. Um, the paresthesia that's tingling. Sometimes people will describe it as pins and needles. There are multiple causes for that. Um, so it, it is something to always mention to your doctor, even if you don't think that it's related 
mention these symptoms. There are a lot of symptoms related to perimenopause. So be sure to mention them. Okay. You can have changes in your body odor. So don't be surprised if that happens too. Sometimes people don't um, correlate that with perimenopause, but it can absolutely happen. And that sometimes is also related to candida overgrowth in the body. And candida is a yeast that we have in our bodies naturally. It feeds on sugar though. And if you have high progesterone, you're more likely to have a candida infection. So here are some red flag symptoms. Red flag symptoms mean you need to see your doctor if this is happening. Could it just be your body's way of going through perimenopause? Sure, it could be. Could it also be something more serious? Yes. So if your cycles are shorter than 21 days, see your doctor. Now, remember, we talked about a normal cycle being or typical cycle being 28 days. So now if your cycle is a full week shorter than typical, that's a sign to see your doctor. If you notice bleeding between the cycles, even if it's just some spotting, another reason to see your doctor, that can be a sign of something more serious. If you are bleeding so much that you have to change your pad, your tampon, or your menstrual cup, menstrual cup is what I prefer, by the way, is what I recommend to my patients every two hours or less, then talk to your doctor about that as well. If the clots that you pass, if you normally pass some blood clots, that's not a concern at all. Totally normal. Um, it has just to do with the breakdown of the uterine lining. But if you are passing clots that are bigger than the size of a quarter, that's concerning. And if you get, you start getting some headaches, um, if it's the worst headache or the worst migraine you have ever had, sure, it could be related to perimenopause, but since it could be something more serious, please take this as a sign to test. Okay. That brings us to test. Don't guess. So, um, what this slide is about is sometimes, um, people won't know really what's going on. And so they just want to say, well, it might be that, or it might be this, but we have what we need to test, to get answers. We don't have to waste time going down different avenues and different rabbit holes, getting all tripped up when we have what we need. The dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, the Dutch test is wonderful. It looks at the metabolites of your hormones in your body by testing your urine. And you do this test at home. As you saw in the graph earlier, our hormones are changing throughout the month. And so you can go and get your blood drawn, which sometimes um, doctors will do that. They'll do like, they'll check FSH or they'll check estradiol, which is a form of estrogen. And those could look normal because we need, because at that moment when they tested them, they were normal, but that doesn't mean that they always are. So this dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, the Dutch test gives us a lot more information. And remember with that shaky slide where it was talking about how the entire endocrine system is affected, the Dutch test looks at more of our endocrine system, not all of it, but more of it. So it'll tell us about the cortisol. Remember during perimenopause, the estrogen is transitioning from being created primarily by the ovaries to now the adrenal glands and adrenal glands are what um, release the cortisol to your body. And that cortisol um, is part of our fight or flight, right? We, we want that cortisol because we need it to keep us going. But sometimes if we're going so, 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 so much, those cortisol levels are high or our body has a hard time breaking it down and getting it out. Melatonin is related to sleep. You can have sleep disturbances during perimenopause. So is the sleep disturbance because you're low in melatonin or is it just because the progesterone is lower? Um, the other test that I really like to run with my patients is a food sensitivity test. If you're eating foods that you're sensitive to, you're creating inflammation within your body. And inflammation can cause an entire host of symptoms on its own. Plus, 
neurotransmitters like serotonin are made in our gut. So if you're having inflammation there, you're not properly making those neurotransmitters, which is absolutely going to affect your mood. The other thing that, um, that inflammation can affect is your body's ability to absorb the nutrients that you're eating. And we want to make sure that not only are you eating quality food, but that you're getting all of the benefit from it. So the food sensitivity test that I really like running also has the candida and yeast test. As I mentioned just a little bit ago, if you have high progesterone, you are more likely to have high candida. So candida being that um, fungus that lives in everyone, it can get overgrown and out of control because it is opportunistic. And if you've taken antibiotics, you're at a higher risk because you've wiped out some of the healthy microbiome. And now that opportunistic candida is taking over that space. So it's important for us to, um, for us to look at the food sensitivities as well. So here are recommended labs. Um, the CBC is a complete blood count. This looks at the overall health of your blood and your immune system. This can tell us um, if you have markers for anemia, which is low iron in, um, if you have iron deficient anemia, um, it's a low iron in, um, in your body. And that can be related to those heavy menstrual cycles that I was talking about. And the CMP, this is the comprehensive metabolic panel. It tells us about your kidney and liver health, which is important for us to identify how you're doing. Also though, it tells us about your glucose. Remember about how you can have insulin resistance. So insulin is supposed to take the glucose, the sugar that's in your blood and push it into cells. But sometimes that uh, the cells aren't as receptive to the insulin as they were before. And we call that insulin resistance. So we like looking at your glucose with the CMP. And then if your glucose is higher on that, we might run another test called a hemoglobin A1C. And this gives us over three months, it measures what kind of your average glucose was like. So then we know, hmm, is this something that we need to worry about? Also, we might order another insulin test so we can see just where that's at in your body. Now below that you see TSH and this stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Your doctor may have run this. Sometimes they'll even run a free T4. We also though, we look at free T3 and then we look at the antibodies, the anti-thyroid peroxidase and anti-thyroglobulin. The reason we do that is those are the markers for autoimmune thyroid conditions. The last on this list is C-reactive protein. That's a marker for overall inflammation in the body. Now, depending on what symptoms you present with, in addition to these perimenopause type symptoms, we might run additional labs like Epstein-Barr virus. Um, it can stay dormant in the body and then reactivate at different periods of your life, especially when you're under stress and perimenopause is stressful to the body. You might also consider mold or Lyme's disease, depending on your symptoms. So that's why it's so important when you see your doctor to share all of your symptoms, because doctors are kind of detectives too. They work to put all the pieces, um, all of the clues that you're feeling, they put it all together and then they can help figure out what that root cause is. Okay, so this is our naturopathic therapeutic order. And as you can see, everything is built upon that base. And that base is what we call our determinants of health. These are the decisions that you make every day that put you on the road to health and healing or to disease and dysfunction. So this is what you eat. This is what you drink. This is your sleep. This is your exercise. This is your community involvement. This is your family relationships. This is your stress. So we really put a lot of emphasis, not just during perimenopause, but as I mentioned before, it's a good time to pause. So you can say, okay, how is my diet? How is my hydration? Am I getting enough water? Are my eyes feeling dry and my skin dry because of perimenopause or because I need to hydrate and I don't have those hormones regulating me 
even in a dehydrated state? Do I have the brain fog because I need to be eating foods that have less inflammation? So that brings us to some supportive measures that you can do while your body is going through perimenopause. The first is to avoid certain things. And I do have alcohol on the avoid list, not the limit list. And that is for a specific reason. We know based on the research that there is no safe amount of alcohol when it comes to cancers. So completely avoiding alcohol is, is your best bet for um, reducing your risk of cancer when it comes to alcohol consumption. Um, also though, it's not my job to tell you what to do. It is my job, Dr. Means teacher, it is my job to educate you so that you can make the best choice for yourself in your life. Avoid fried foods. A lot of times these have trans fats in them. Avoid chemical sweeteners. Um, these disrupt your um, <laughs> uh, chemical uh, sweeteners, cause inflammation in the brain, and they also um, can disrupt your endocrine system as well as, well as affect your nervous system. Um, sometimes people who in, uh, eat a lot of chemical sweeteners will even get tremors and things like that avoid margarine. Um, and I have endocrine disruptors on the list. These are um, a lot in our environment. Phthalates, which are uh, responsible for artificial fragrances in lotions and candles, etc. They are endocrine disruptors. Um, some chemical sunscreens have endocrine disruptors in them. There is a app called um, Think. T-H-I-N-K, Dirty, D-I-R-T-Y. This is an app that you can get for your phone. You can scan barcodes. Um, it, it, the Environmental Working Group is who made this app. And you can scan the barcodes and it will tell you if that product has endocrine disruptors in it and how potentially dangerous it could be for you. Now, um, you want to limit sugar. Sugar is inflammatory for the body and it lowers your immune system. Spicy foods can trigger hot flashes. So if you're experiencing hot flashes, you wanna bring down the spicy food. Also, we talked about how you can have some gastric changes. If spicy food used to not bother you before, but now you notice you start getting some reflux, a little bit of heartburn, um, limit those spicy foods then. Your body's trying to communicate with you and limit processed foods. These also can cause inflammation. A lot of times they have um, additives in them that make your body store fat as opposed to being the nutrients that we need. Empty calories, sometimes we call it. Okay, so what can we increase? We can increase our vegetables. At least five servings of vegetables a day will give you enough fiber and nutrients. You can supplement those vegetables with some fruit, right? Fruit's delicious, but it does have sugar in it too. So if candida is an issue for you, even the sugar in fruit can feed that. Flax seeds are helpful. They, um, they will um, activate estrogen receptors, not exactly the same way that estrogen will, but um, there have been some tests that show that regularly eating flax seeds, not the oil, but the flax seeds themselves can be anti-inflammatory and also they can help support the changes during perimenopause. And your hormones are made from fat. The, um, all hormones are made from cholesterol. So you need healthy fats. This is not the time to be limiting your healthy fats. So if you eat wild caught fish um, or avocados, and I did specifically say wild caught fish because farmed fish has endocrine disruptors in it. A lot of times it also has heavy medical, um, heavy metals and other contaminants that you don't want to be eating, but wild caught fish, um, and avocados are really great ways to get in some of those healthy fats. Um, some supplements that are typically good for everyone, um, are magnesium. Now there are different types of magnesium. If you are not having a bowel movement at least once a day, magnesium citrate is the form that you would be looking for. If you're having leg cramps 
or difficulty falling asleep, or if you feel tight, that's magnesium glycinate. Magnesium glycinate works really well on the muscles. If you're having high blood pressure, I should say if you're having slightly elevated <laughs> blood pressure, you could try magnesium torate. Um, that's with a T. Magnesium torate can help with blood pressure. So these are all different types. Uh, they're all magnesium, but it's different types depending on what support you need. Um, B vitamins. B vitamins are water soluble. So typically if you have too much, your body will just flush them out. Um, when you're looking at B vitamins for B12, I recommend getting a methylated form. So it will say methyl cobolamine and methylated means that it's already active. Your body doesn't have to try to convert it. So you'll be able to use that vitamin D where we live here in, um, the Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan area, um, at, at this, um, at this season, at this time, we're not getting as much sunlight. So 5,000 I use a day of vitamin D is a maintenance dose. Okay. Zinc, um, zinc and copper do compete. So you don't want to be taking more than 15 milligrams of zinc a day, but zinc is really important for the immune system. And it's, it's very helpful for our hormones too. Glutathione is the primary uh, antioxidant in the liver, and it's your liver who's processing all of your hormones and flushing them out of your body. So the more that you can do to support your liver and your liver health, like by taking glutathione, the better off you'll be. Now I mentioned about how this is a good time to pause. So if you have not already been doing weight bearing exercise, now is a good time to do that. Weight bearing exercise helps to support your muscle mass. Remember we talked about during perimenopause, you can lose muscle mass. So the weight bearing exercise helps with that, but also it helps with your bone health. You're at less of a risk for osteopenia and osteoporosis. If you are regularly doing weight bearing exercises, it makes your bones stronger. Also sleep hygiene. If you are one of the people who falls asleep on their phone, falls asleep with it next to their bed, wakes up and is right back on that phone. This might be a time to set the phone away at least one hour before you go to sleep so that you can get that good restful sleep and stress management. We like to think of stress management in terms of, oh, let's go on vacation and let's do all these fun things. And sometimes stress, stress management is work. Sometimes it's looking at what's causing stress in your life, either relationships or financial stress, or trying to figure out what to eat every night and being proactive. Meal planning, for example, seeing a counselor or therapist to get you, give you some tools for healthy communication, for managing your own emotions, right? Seeing a doctor to help you with your perimenopause if that's stressing you out, creating a budget if financial stress is an issue for you. So um, stress management, yes, I love things like yoga and meditation and breath work, and absolutely those are wonderful. And sometimes our stress management goes beyond that. So don't downplay the importance of that. Okay, other treatment options. There are herbs that are hormone uh, modulating. I purposely did not add them specifically to this slide because they, are, they should be um, prescribed indiv individually, not for um, a wide audience because they will impact people differently. And even though it's an herb and we think, oh, it's natural, it must be safe. There are still interactions. There are definitely herb drug interactions. And so if you're taking medications, you wanna be really mindful about what herbs you're using as well. Um, there are estriol suppositories, and these are a form of estrogen that's not, um, it doesn't last as long in the body as, um, as the normal estrogen supplements that a gynecologist might prescribe. Um, but they will help with some of that vaginal dryness, some of the irritation, some of the pain and discomfort. It can reduce the frequency of urinary tract infections. Um, neurostructural integration technique 
is a manual technique. It's okay if you haven't heard of it. It's um, it's an offshoot uh, and more specific of Bowen therapy. So the purpose is to stimulate muscle bellies throughout the body on, on specific muscles to re-establish uh, the connection between the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system. And when this is done, it brings the body back to balance. So we talked about how the hormones have us all out of balance, right? This technique is a gentle way to bring the body back into balance. And I've seen it work really well, specifically on some of my patients for hot flashes in particular. Some of the other um, symptoms as well, some of the joint pain, some of the digestive issues, um, but really for hot flashes, it's worked very well. Alpha stim is, um, um, alpha stim is useful for insomnia, depression, and anxiety. There are little electrode ear clips and um, you put them on your ears and it sends a gentle alpha wave through the brain. And the, this has actually been tested to be as effective as pharmaceuticals for the treatment of insomnia, anxiety, and depression. If you're not having a bowel movement every day, that means that what your body has determined is waste is sitting in your body still. So your body says this is trash, but then it's not getting out. It would be like taking all of the garbage in your house and putting it in one room. That's not the same as getting it out. And our body is, is already out of balance. And now as your large intestine, the job of the large intestine is to absorb water out of the waste. So it doesn't get, so it can be reused, right? If that stool is sitting there, all of those toxins are sitting there too. So colon hydrotherapy can help you to have regular bowel movements, clear out your colon. And last is homeopathy. I love homeopathy. We can use it not only to treat some of the symptoms and to ease the ups and downs of perimenopause, but also in some cases to completely heal all of the symptoms. And sometimes issues that people were having never end up coming back at all, which is amazing. Okay, so um, this is the time for questions. There was a question that had come in previously um, and it was specifically asking about the estrogen creams. So estradiol is the estrogen cream that a gynecologist will prescribe. On the bottle or on the box, there is a warning about um, cancer risk and blood clot risk. The warning that is on the box has more to do with other forms of the estradiol and less with the actual cream. There's been a lot of research that says that the cream does not increase risk of breast cancer or blood clots. That said, some individuals with a family history of breast cancer or a personal history of breast cancer may not want to use that because it, it still seems too risky to them, in which case we could use the other suppositories that I had um, mentioned. They, uh, it's not the strongest form of estrogen, so it, um, it stays even more localized. You do have to use it more frequently though, because it's not as powerful as the other form. Um, it also carries less risk as well. Um, one other question was for the brain fog specifically. What can help with that? Candida overgrowth can cause brain fog and so can inflammation within the body. So really getting back to pausing and looking at what's happening with your body. Are you hydrated? One of the first signs of dehydration is brain fog. Your brain can't function well if it doesn't have the hydration that it needs. Look at the foods that you're eating. Try to reduce your risk um, for inflammation, right? We can't avoid everything, but as much as you can, try to avoid those inflammatory foods. Try to avoid, um, well, most of the time it's, sorry, most of the time it's food that people are eating and they don't even realize that it's causing their inflammation. It's the sugar that we've talked about that causes a lot of inflammation. 
So um, be mindful about all of these things. Use the signs and symptoms to determine what systems and organs within the body are struggling. And then you can work with a naturopathic doctor to help heal, not just treat those symptoms of perimenopause, but actually heal those organs and systems that have been overworked and need that support. Thank you so much.